It's football mania in the Wiregrass area. It's been a day of excitement and pregame celebrating in off. The Bobcats of Coach Randy Griffin take a 9-0 record to Andalusia tonight at 7.30. The Andalusia Bulldogs have dominated 3A high school football, having gone undefeated in 58 games until the defeat in Elba last week. Andalusia appears to be the favorite, but Op ignores that. Coach Griffin is somewhat surprised that his team goes into tonight's game with a perfect record. We're real concerned, but we're, we're worried here at Op, and we're happy to be in the situation we're in. That's something you know that we're not used to. We've had good records here. We've uh, Our young men in the town of Op, we've had two eight, 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 two seasons the last two years, and tonight we're 9-0, and oh, and it's something that first year we might not have thought we was going to be here, but we're happy to be in the situation we are and happy to be have an opportunity to go to state playoff, which we might not have thought we was going to be able to do it the first of the year. But we're real happy with the situation right now. And everybody in town is really excited. And as you can see around town, that uh, everybody's prepared for the ball game. And our people deserve a win. And we're just looking forward to the ball game tonight. The townspeople here are behind their team 100%. Many got a four hours start for the 20 mile drive to Andalusia. This game goes back, I believe, several years. Just back when I was in high school, the more spirit goes on between Op and Andalusia than any other game I know of. Well, they're number one in the state. You are formerly number one in the state. Hop's number one now, but they are defending state champions, and we're undefeated, and we're going to go over and beat them. Hop hasn't won in a long, long time, and I hope they win tonight. We all out for blood. I mean, when we cross the railroad tracks over at Sanford, it's just dog eat dog. I mean, we in Andalusia territory, and uh, we threading on uh, a risky proposition to eat them just going over there. Phil, this is number 12, Jerry Hartzog, the quarterback for the op team, and he has something to say to those folks in Andalusia. Well, we'd just like to warn Andalusia now because we're going to be coming over in full force and we're going to be coming over to win, and y'all just better be ready. The federal court jury returned to the courtroom at 10.35 this morning after deliberating two and a half hours. The 14-member panel found the Foshi brothers, Wheeler, and E.C. Crumfoshi guilty on all nine counts of mail fraud in connection with a check-cutting scheme. There was no emotion evidenced in the courtroom and the guilty verdict was announced, and there was limited comment by the defendants after they left the courtroom. Comment, sir. Don't have any comment, George, except I'm still keeping the faith, and I might have some comment tomorrow. We can't really. The case is not over yet. Judge Johnson uh, delayed uh, sentencing till in the morning nine o'clock so we really can't comment because the case isn't over yet until tomorrow any reactions to far as surprise or otherwise today? disappointment of course uh, we'll see tomorrow morning what judge johnson does and i guess we'd be free to comment after that thank you the foshies were convicted of mail fraud charges in june of 1976 the each were sentenced to 18 months in federal prison the convictions were overturned by the fifth circuit court of appeals in new orleans when it ruled that the U.S. District Court judge in Montgomery failed to permit arguments that the Foshis acted in good faith without any intent to defraud in the use of check cutting. Check cutting during the retrial was described as a means of obtaining illegal credit. The Foshis testified they had no intentions of cheating anyone out of money. Six banks in South Alabama were involved when the Foshi business overdrew accounts in some of the banks to cover withdrawals from other banks. Testimony also revealed that several loans were obtained and that some remain outstanding. The Foshis have auctioned off their farm and their home at Red Level to pay off those debts. The jury was given the case yesterday. It studied it for about an hour before it was recessed. Deliberation began again today. 30 minutes before rendering its verdict, the jury returned to the courtroom to say it had no decision. Judge Frank Johnson, Jr. told the panel it had not deliberated long enough, so the jury again retired and returned a half hour later with his decision guilty. Judge Johnson has set tomorrow morning at nine o'clock for sentencing. Reporting from Montgomery Federal Court, George Mitchell, WSFA TV News. Well, since uh, Mr. Baxley filed his injunction, uh, we are waiting to see what action the Public Service Commission will take before we make any formal move for a new rate request. 
would it be best for the power company to receive a, a rate increase through the complaint case, or would it be uh, better to go back and ask for an emergency rate increase? We, we feel like that over the past 12 months in the governor's complaint case that we have presented sufficient testimony. And you know when we file for a rate request with the Public Service Commission, that's an expensive proposition because it usually takes about six months to get the testimony in. We have just gotten through doing all of that. And we would like to see the Public Service Commission rule on the testimony that they have just heard. When do you plan to go back before the PSC? Uh, I can't answer that because I don't know the outcome of the circuit court ruling on Mr. Baxter's injunction against us. Now, if you have to file an emergency rate increase, will that prolong the proceedings? Yes, it, it would mean that we'd have to go back on the, on the formal manner of another rate request. So, and that would probably be six months down the road. Now, if we filed an emergency rate increase, I suppose the Public Service Commission would act on that as an emergency, and it might not take that long. One week ago, the Montgomery Police Department dispatched a special community relations team and a team of four police officers known as the Tango Team to the Smiley Court housing project here in West Montgomery to try to combat some of the crimes of violence, vandalism, burglaries, and crimes against the elderly. In one week, they say the situation has quietened down so much here in Smiley Court that the birds have actually returned to the area and are singing again. Sergeant Anderson, as a community relations officer here, what changes have you seen in one week at Smiley Court? Well, I've seen a tremendous change uh, in Smiley Court. Uh, it used to be uh, over in the park uh, to our right. The uh, hoodlums and thugs uh, would gather up there every day and they'll move out into the community, burglarizing and terrorizing the community. And since we've been here, we haven't had one call at headquarters from Smiley Court concerning burglaries. There have been no burglaries. There have been no vandalism and no acts of violence since we've been here in the community. Since that time, we've made approximately 15 arrests, and we've got the names of the known burglars, and we expect more arrests in the near future. It's been a big change in life here since Sergeant Allison taking over and opening this office out here. I say it's around about 90% change. Like what? What sort of changes? Well, it, we've been having people getting out here at night, walking the streets, throwing bottles, breaking in and <clears throat> stirring the neighbors around here, and we haven't had none of that since they've been out here. Curbing violence here at Smiley Court is not all they have in mind. On Saturday, they've got Operation Pride, a massive cleanup campaign for the community, and after that, they plan to teach citizenship classes. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News at Smiley Court in West Montgomery. Ball team also, John. <laughs> and thereby provide a capability comparable to what industry could provide for itself. You know, I was reading a day or two ago that now one farmer feeds 59 people. And I was thinking about, maybe we were not typical at lunch, I don't think, the food we consume, but, you know, to feed this crowd of people, it takes 17 farmers. That emphasizes the efficiency of the American farmer in 1978. I don't mean just one time, feeding us all the time. Yet I... Also recall that since 1973 that the importation of food has increased 145 percent while domestically our food production has only increased 85 percent. Help our football team also, John. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for as full-time farmers constitute a small and smaller proportion of our total population and as there are need for capital, credit, technology and management increases, their needs for sound 
practical agricultural research, research results um, increase proportionately. With President Carter before coming here. Yes, sir. Could you, could you describe for us your conversation with him as best you can? Well, the president was very kind to call and uh, offer congratulations, which uh, what appeared to be a win. And uh, of course, I told him we love Miss Lillian over at uh, uh, Auburn and invited him down to the Auburn Georgia game uh, next Saturday a week. He said he was keeping up with all the ball clubs, but didn't think he could make it, and uh, that was the extent of the conversation. I was very appreciative of his call, and it was a congratulatory call. Governor Elect, I'm calling you Governor Elect. You say you think it's too early. What would be your first move as governor of the state of Alabama when you move up on the hill? You talked about illiteracy. You, you seem to be really concerned about illiteracy in the state of Alabama. Norman, we've, uh, we've talked about that, and we've talked also about a new constitution. And uh, we want to get into doing the things that you have to do to have a constitution, a draft, uh, to get it out to the House and to the Senate. Uh, give them plenty of time to study it. I think that is the role, uh, one of the key roles of the executive branches. Get the information to the members of the House and Senate. I look at that relationship as a partnership, and uh, we're going to treat it as such. So we'll lead from there. Uh, uh, they tell me that two weeks before, uh, between inauguration and uh, budget time in early February, and uh, that's a short time, and I'm hopeful that maybe they will consider giving me a little more time on the budget. Will you start seriously considering cabinet appointments? Uh, we will seriously go to work uh, in the morning. In the morning? If the votes continue and we win this election, uh, we would be derelict not to immediately start working tomorrow in an interim to make this transition as smooth as we can work it. Thank you very much, Governor-elect Bob James. Thank you, Norman. I'm standing here with Attorney General Charles Graddock. Mr. Graddock, in your term in office, do you expect to see many death penalties carried out? Well, I, I hope not, because uh, I'd like to think that we're not going to have the type of criminal activity in this state that we've had for the past uh, few years. Uh, although if we have the type of crimes that uh, deserve the death penalty, then uh, I will see as Attorney General that the right policy and mood and professionalism is carried out to see that those individuals are given the appropriate punishment, and if it's death, and. Uh, uh, certainly you know that I feel that they should uh, receive that type of punishment. What changes do you expect to make in office? Well, I think anyone that comes into an office uh, after someone else has had it for eight years will make uh, the changes that he feels is necessary to carry an efficient and professional operation into effect for this state. Uh, I expect to have some organizational changes. I expect to set up certain bureaus and divisions in that office to direct ourselves to the attentions and priorities that I feel are most important, and that's repeat offenders, uh, the classification of prisoners. Uh, they're turning people loose in this state today that shouldn't be turned loose from our penitentiaries. Uh, I hope that I will have some effect on that. I'll work as hard as I can to represent the people. and. I tell you, I'm just really excited about the prospects of having a governor like Bob James and a lieutenant governor like George McMillan and the cooperation uh, of a legislature that uh, we have a lot of new members. And for the first time in a long time, we're going to have a new beginning and we're going to go forward and do the right kind of things that the people elected us to do. And I'm just extremely uh, excited about it. I, I really am. I do. do you expect to have many changes in staff then among the attorneys general? Well, you know, uh, I didn't know uh, about the staffing situation, and I found out that the majority of the staff are merit system employees, uh, and I have three appointments, which I've already made, and I hope that the individuals that work in the Attorney General's office are as dedicated to doing the right kind of job that I feel needs to be done as I am, and of course, if they aren't, then uh, I, I'm sure they'll find some place else to go, but I don't feel like we're going to have much problem. We're going to have a lot of pride in what we do and a lot of dedication. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Here at Democratic headquarters, a lot of people are coming in there. There's several uh, people who are running. We'll be interviewing as the evening goes on. And now back to you, Bob. 
Representative uh, Bill Dickinson. Mr. Mitchell, how, what is your reaction to the vote tabulation so far? Chris, I'm extremely delighted at the tremendous vote we've gotten here in Montgomery County. You know, this is the closest anyone has gotten uh, to the incumbent in the course of the many contests he's had. But I've never been involved in a race where there's so many wonderful people participating uh, in our behalf. And uh, I'm still optimistic about the outcome. I'm just grateful as I can be for the tremendous help that I've received. You know, you don't uh, win a race or even be a viable candidate without good, fine support from people who reside in that particular area, and that's what we've had. And I just want to express my heartfelt thanks to all those who've helped us so much in this race. Is there any particular part of this race that you would have run any differently now that you can look back on it? Well, we put in 18-hour days for many, many weeks, and we've been running for about 11 months. I tried not only to bring forward the things that I wanted to do in Washington, the, uh, particularly with respect to the military bases. I think we've raised some new issues, and I think we're going to see in the future whoever's elected more attention given to these military bases. Uh, I pointed out in the race uh, what I thought were inadequacies in the incumbent's record, especially uh, being on the job. Uh, I don't regard those things as uh, negative. I know some people said to me in the waning days of the campaign, uh, that's somewhat negative. But when you run against an incumbent, uh, the record is obviously something that must be part of the race. So I advocated my positive. I pointed out his negative. Uh, we fought awfully hard. And uh, I'm just hoping that before the evening's over, it'll, uh, it'll pay dividends. But whatever the outcome, I just want the people of this district to know how grateful I am to have been a candidate. It's been a real high honor to be a candidate in this race. And uh, if I am successful, then I'm going to make people proud of me, and we're going to work hard in Washington. What makes people who are in a predominantly Democratic state vote for a Republican? The power of the incumbency is, is almost uh, unbelievable, as you know. The franking privileges, the free mailing privileges, and statistics show that incumbents uh, win over 95 percent of the races each year that uh, they're in. So I don't think it's necessarily the Democrat or the Republican. It's a question of a man being an incumbent. Is there anything in this race uh, on your opponent's uh, behalf or in any part of the race which you feel was your, feel was your downfall? No, if my, there is a downfall? No, my opponent's a good man. He's, uh, he's been there 14 years, as you know. I just thought uh, it was time for a change. And I felt in my heart that I could do a better job. If I did not think that, uh, I would not have sought the race. But he has been a very competitive uh, opponent in this race, and I commend him wholeheartedly for that. All right. Well, thank you very much, you, Mr. Mr. Mitchell, Chris. for talking with us. And the race is not over, and we will be keeping an eye. Do you know what? This has been the most exciting time of my life. It really has. It has been such a pleasure to go into the 13 counties. I really can hardly wait to start on the next campaign. In fact, I'm starting on Friday. Well, uh, <laughs> you can go to work Monday. <laughs> I'm going to take some time. Listen, uh, I, I just can't tell you how much this means to me and, and, uh, and how proud I am to be associated with all of you. You know, a, a, a campaign is like a mosaic or, or a, a giant jigsaw puzzle. It's a thousand pieces. Now, no candidate, as I've said before, no, no candidate can win it by himself. He can blow it by himself. You know, if one, one, one uh, fluff on TV, and you could probably lose the whole campaign. But it all comes together on election night, and all of you, the well wishes, the ones who have dial the phones, have licked the stamps, and addressed the envelopes, and knocked on the doors, and made the phone calls, and put up the signs. All of these are the thousands of pieces that go together to make the pattern, to make it possible. And I want to thank the thousands of you that uh, have helped, that have uh, actively participated, and in many, many thousands that voted. I haven't got the final returns yet, but the last I heard, we will well ahead and, and closed out and over 8,000 votes ahead in, I think, uh, nine of the 13 counties. I, I, I don't know what has happened since in, in transit over here. But uh, 
I am very humble, very, very proud. Uh, and I just want you to know that uh, this time we had a two-edged sword, and this, this, this was the main sword right, right here. And, hey. <laughs> yeah. she, she, she's been, if, if I worked as hard as she worked, uh, we wouldn't have had near this close a uh, margin, I'll tell you. And the bells, you, you are beautiful. The boys and bells, you and I, just, I just want you to know that that, that Modolphin Bells even came up to Montgomery to help. Now, I mean, we, they called and said they had covered everything in the, gui the wire grass three times. Where else was that to go? And so uh, they were here. here, here and all that. <laughs> so I, I don't know what else to say except thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm humbled and, and, and most appreciative of you being here. Uh, it's, we, it was a much tougher c campaign than I anticipated, but there, was, there were just two factors that, that you couldn't anticipate. One was that we would be in session as late as we were. The second was my physical disability with a slipped disc. I got off the plane three weeks ago to campaign in a wheelchair, and I've progressively uh, I improved uh, thank to, thanks to some in, in this room. And uh, I'm feeling good. I've been without pain over a week now, and, and it's just, it's just tremendous. I, I can't think of all of the people I need to thank. And so let me say that uh, for the next two years, we're going to work hard. Uh, and I can assure you, and I would like to assure whatever prospective opponent there will be, that I know there will be one, but I know there can't be but one. <laughs> but this, this time, this time we beat the governor. We beat the straight ticket. We beat the organized labor who contributed thousands of dollars. I got not one cent. We beat the whole spectrum, and we're going to do it again with your help. And thank you. Very much. Circuit Judge Joseph Phelps and lawyers for both the power company and consumers were bogged down with legal technicalities and precedents through most of the hearing. However, according to the governor and Attorney General Bill Baxley, the Public Service Commission has no authority to grant a rate increase to Alabama Power Company. Yeah, I'll just state as a matter of fact, the Alabama Power Company has not filed any schedule of rates. That was uh, that was exhibited here today. They finally were put in the position where they had to confess they have filed no schedule of rates. They have not filed any schedule of rates, and it's inconceivable to me how any schedule of rates can be approved that hadn't even been filed. And they admitted that today. Attorneys for the power company contend they did follow the proper procedures, and to file another request would put undue financial burden on the utility. If the position that the complainants are taking here is correct. They, they, they are essentially saying that it would be a void order because it would be without authority of the commission to issue a rate increase in a complaint proceeding. It gets kind of complicated, doesn't it? Judge Joseph Phelps is taking the case under advisory and is expected to render a decision in the morning. From Montgomery County Circuit Court, Janet May, WSFA TV News. Mr. Bracey and I notified the Housing Authority as quickly as we could of the existing conditions and of the continuing uh, conditions. Then there's approximately four and a half feet from each corner, uh, and then you're talking about approximately three feet wide. The concrete as opposed to the four inches of concrete. So if any of you were to go to the Jackson four inches, which were shown removal was in process, and he had to take a, uh, and these underpinnings existed in six buildings out of Jackson Heights. Uh, the facts uh, that brought about this request for a change order exist with regard to demolition, 
eight hours of forty dollars at forty dollars per hour on each of the buildings loading eighteen hours He has just he left going home. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, well we're gonna we want we need we gotta get this back. Uh, to begin with the first night we had thirteen patrol cars that was windshields demolished, tires cut, slashed. Telephone ripped out and broken, and uh, general havoc of the whole thing. And they tossed someone, maybe not the union, somebody did, I don't know, but the whole north end of the building there. We have over $4,000 worth of broken glass in the end of the complex. Have any idea how much the damage to the patrol cars will cost the city? Well, then, right now, I believe they said it possibly would be around $7,000, what they have figured up now at the city barn. They have 27 vehicles out there with the windshields, demolished truck things, and they said that would run above 20,000 or somewhere in the neighborhood of that for the repairs. None of our officers that we know of have been involved in anything of that nature, and I don't believe that they would. What we have is a lot of kids down here, and I use that term loosely, some of them range in age from 14 up to 25 that take advantage of a situation like this. It's not uncommon. Uh, if the city does obtain an injunction against you, are you going back to work? We're not going back to work until we get union recognition. Are you speaking for the uh, entire striking police force? I'm speaking for the 16 or 18 officers, 17 officers that we have. We're all sticking together. One of Montgomery's recently installed civil defense warning system sirens is located at Peter Crump School on Woodley Road. The other is in the 2800 block of Day Street. The civil defense office reported the Day Street siren went off at the scheduled 3.30 p.m. test time, but at Peter Crump, the system failed. The reason, according to the civil defense office, a faulty relay in the telephone system. A problem authorities say will be corrected tomorrow. The sirens heard in the Peter Crump School area during the test period today come from the system installed at Seth Johnson School. Montgomery's routine monthly test of the siren warning system is conducted the first Wednesday of each month. Should the city be under a tornado watch, the test is conducted the following day. In an actual situation, a tornado warning will be a steady three-minute blast of the sirens, followed by 30 seconds of silence, then followed by another three-minute blast of the sirens. The same applies in the event of a nuclear situation, except the sound would rise and fall. George Mitchell, WSFA TV News. You could be the person the Montgomery Police Department is looking for, because we're looking for someone who wants to be special. As like these are being run as public service spots and they're being run as paid commercials for the Montgomery Police Department in their effort to recruit more police officers. Montgomery has 200 miles of police jurisdiction. 51 of those miles are within the city limits. The men and women who police this city are paid a starting salary of $9,800 a year to catch criminals ranging from shoplifters to murderers. For the past year and a half, there's been a steady migration of policemen many with an average of five years experience from the local police department to higher paying state, federal, or private positions. The situation has created a problem of experienced patrolmen, and the city can't compete with other agencies in terms of pay. Chief of Police, Charles Swindle. It has had an effect on the police departments from a simple standpoint that we can't man the number of patrol districts that we want to. But uh, I have to point out that in the past six months, we've had a percentage of crime reduction in the city of Montgomery. And I attribute this to the fact that the young officers that we do have on the street is tightening their belts, and the supervisors is pulling it all together, and they're doing a better job, even with the shortage of people. Now, since this 98 has left the police department, we've had uh, 
uh, six of them, to return to the department. And as you know, we lost uh, 29 people to the Board of Corrections. And since uh, uh, in the past week, I've rehired two of those. That Why are them. they leaving? They're leaving for a simple economical reasons, money. The state of Alabama is paying their uh, prison guards some $2,500 to $3,000 a month, a year, more than we can pay a police officer, uh, even with the increases in salary that we've received under the, in the past 18 months. Many of those who have left the department over the last 12 months say they love police work, but they just couldn't support their families on the pay, and so they had to leave. And then there are those who are saying they are looking for the first higher paying job they can find, and they will be gone. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News reporting. that spits fire and always tries to save the earth? Godzilla, the Godzilla Super 90, featuring Jana of the Jungle and Johnny Quest. Starting November 4th, Saturday morning on NBC is going to be out of this world.